All right. So this week we're doing something a little bit different. I'll be talking about the NFL first and future impact detection competition that we worked on a while ago. It's been closed for a couple of weeks. We kind of waited for everyone to post and share their solution so we could um, kind of report a little bit more completely on them. Um, I'm Ryan Chesler, one of the organizers for San Diego Machine Learning. Um, and so just a little bit about me. I am a data scientist for H2O. I think a lot of you know me already, but I'll still go over this for anyone who's new. Um, I'm a Kaggle triple master, hopefully going to be a discussion grandmaster soon. I just need to do um, some extra bronze medals on the discussion stuff. So I'll, I'll hopefully get there soon. Um, and I'm one of the organizers along with Ted. And this is my profile. I've done pretty good on some competitions and I'm very active on this site. I do a lot of work on Kaggle, but I've been doing it for a few years now. Um, one of the special things about this competition, at least for me, was I got to team up with Marios, one of my coworkers. He was at one point um, number one in the world on Kaggle. So it's interesting to work with super smart people and learn some of their tricks and how they organize um, their machine learning experiments and, and approach problems and stuff like that. Um, so that was really nice, but the problem was this competition already was a short one. It only went for one month. And then I only teamed up with Mario was about two weeks before the end of the competition. So we didn't have that much time to collaborate. And then at the same time, we were also battling a time difference. I, I believe that he's in London, so he's several hours off. So when I would be um, staying up super late at night, he would just start waking up and then it would keep me up even later because he would start um, pinging me with the, all of the stuff I had sent him overnight. Um, since it was so short, the only way that we really communicated, we had one um, Slack call. And then after that, we were just all text. I think that it's kind of important to, when you team up with people, you've had some form of communication. It's kind of interesting to see how different groups collaborate differently. Some people hardly, hardly talk at all. Some of them never even physically hear each other's voices. Some people use Slack. Some people almost purely just interact through GitHub and just pull requests and stuff like that. Um, in the end, we ended up getting a silver medal. We got 45th place, um, and that was how we did. And so a little bit about the problem. Um, so the, the gist of the problem is we're trying to find helmet collisions from raw 720p video. So you see your stream on TV, that's basically what we had. We didn't have all that much additional information. We're just trying to look at the video. We're trying to say, where did helmet collisions occur? And so what we're trying to do is we're trying to output a bounding box saying in this specific frame, in this specific region of the image, there was some sort of helmet collision. And so on the left side, you can see the CSP predictions and that's sort of um, what we're expected to output. And then on the right side is the actual plotting of the predictions on top of the images. So it's saying it looks like these two players collided. So we can see their home as they look like they're touching. And then on the left side, you can see there's a whole bunch of output saying um, for this specific play in this specific game, from this view, from this video, on this um, on this X, Y axis, it looks like there's this bounding box that represents a collision of some sort. Um, looking at the data that we had, we had 120 videos in the training set, which is very, very, very small in terms of machine learning context. Um, it was kind of a blessing and a curse because obviously you always want more data, but at the same time, video is very difficult to work with. So if we had more video, then it might have been difficult to train models on all of it. Um, so 60 frames per second. So every frame is actually very, very granular. So in between two frames, you might see very little movement actually because it's, it's so frequent. Um, and they're varying lengths. So the way that it works is basically, um, I think it was about 10, 10 frames before the snap is when the video started. And so we know that the play will actually start about 10 frames in, and then everyone starts moving, and then we play until the, the down occurs. Um, 
And so they're, they're varying length videos. Some of them are fairly short. Some of them are a bit longer, but roughly they're not too long. It's, it's like 10 seconds max, probably. Um, and then the, the interesting thing is, so we have 120 videos, but that's actually two different views of the same play. So we only have 60 unique plays. We have the view from the sideline and we have the view from the end line. So we have the one view that's looking down the field and then one view that's looking across the field. And then maybe potentially we could do something interesting, combining the knowledge of the two of those in order to determine um, is there actually a collision on frame. But I'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, and then we have 15 videos in the test set. Um, this was super noisy to score against. So a lot of people, what they do is they make a submission and then they look at how they did on the public leaderboard in order to roughly gauge how they're doing. But this wasn't really a viable method because looking at the public leaderboard, the entire test set is only 15 videos. But then this, the chunk that we were actually looking at was a tiny portion of that. It might have only been like two or three videos. So you could show up as having poor performance, but it turns out you were just bad on a single video. You weren't necessarily bad overall. Um, so it's difficult to gauge against that. Everyone had to do more robust things in terms of validation. Um, one of the other bits of data that we had available was some tabular data representing the the kind of global position of the players so imagine that you're looking at um chess pieces you're looking at their actual positions and then you're looking at their movement over time and that's what um constitutes this this image on the left is you can actually plot and you can say okay they started somewhere around the 23 yard line and then they ran all the way over here and then ended up over here and you see all of their positions throughout time. And so that's possibly very useful because you can say, well, it looks like these two players might have had a coming together here or some other people who are going um, opposite directions or heading towards each other. There might be a possibility of collision there. Um, but the difficulty is we're trying to locate things in reference to the video. And so this top down view would have to be mapped in some way to this crop and this different angle. And so you'd have to some way combine these data sources and that's fairly difficult to do. Some people tried to do it, but um, just putting it out there, we had this data. I don't think very many people used it because it's difficult to actually do that mapping accurately. Um, Additional bits, the data, we also had a folder that had um, JPEG versions. So we had a whole bunch of MP4s, but then they also split them out into a folder of JPEGs for us, just the, just the raw images. Um, and that, that is kind of useful as a convenient, but it doesn't really provide that much value because most people ended up just interacting with the MP4s directly. Um, and so the labels that we have, we have two different things. We have the labels for the helmets and we have the labels for the collisions. And so the labels, labels for the helmets are fairly useful because we have a whole ton of them. There's, there's helmets in every single frame. Um, but then the collisions are much more sparse. So there's only, I want to say, 2,000 about collisions. And so if you're looking across 10,000 frames of video and there's only 2,000 collisions, it makes it so your target is fairly sparse. And so this is what it sort of looks like in video form. So I'll just kind of mention this before I play because it's a short video. But the, the black bounding boxes represent the um, helmets. So this is where all of the helmets are labeled. And then the red is where collisions are occurring. So you can see somewhere in here, right at the beginning, I don't know if I can even get the right frame. There's a single frame where there's a, a red box here. And so um, just kind of putting it in context, there's just a single flash of red and you expect your model to capture that and it's fairly difficult. Um, so people had to overcome that in various different ways. So 
On top of this, we have the labels for the collisions. We have it for based on what they collided with. So it's possible for a helmet to collide with a helmet. It's possible for a helmet to collide with the shoulder. It's possible for someone to get knocked over and their helmet hits the ground. There's lots of different ways that that can be classified. And we were actually given that distinction, which turned out to be useful for some people. And then on top of that, we're also given the, these variables for visibility and confidence, because it's possible that someone actually had a collision, but at a certain camera angle, you can't see it because they're hidden behind other bodies or some other reason. Um, and so it only counts as a collision and they only want it classified if you have above a certain visibility confidence and an actual confidence that there was a collision. So we take the, the two different conditions, we make sure that they're both met, and then we can say, okay, this is a true impact given their labels. Just, I don't know if you can ask questions, but yeah, sure. I noticed that the, the helmets had different um, format for their labels. Is that just how the label was done, or was that was there a task to classify helmets of different teams with different categories or different labels um i don't know that they were any different format i think they were the same format it's it's just the 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 x y coordinates that define the bounding box so, so the red team had like h something and the blue team had like v something oh yeah yeah so there's there's they they gave us the labels for the players so if you if you wanted to you could say i'm going to track number 11 all the way through the play but then they also have the i don't remember exactly what the distinctions were it was like h00 and v00 or something like that and that was basically just saying like um this is someone who's not involved in the play or something like that so it would be people on the sidelines and stuff like that but I don't, I don't think people necessarily try to do anything with that because it's, it's not that useful to say there's someone on the side, but they're not involved in a collision most likely. Got it, thanks. Yeah, that, that was at least my understanding of it. Um, and so moving on to the metric, it was kind of interesting because um, typically you go into a competition and they have, um, RMSE or binary cross entropy or some other thing. And they say basically just do as accurately as possible. But this metric ended up being much more involved because you had to um, meet various different criteria in order to get a correct um, marking. And so some, some person posted the metric calculation and everyone was kind of like, well, we hope this is correct, but we don't necessarily know exactly what it is. Typically, you can just take some off the box thing and you know that it's computing AUC correctly. But with this, um, we, we kind of had to be relying and hope that it was actually exactly what they were calculating. Um, they, they posted the details, but you have to hope that the implementation is also correct. Um, and so the, the details of the metric is they're looking at the F score, F1 score of the boxes with an IOU of greater than 0.35 that's within plus or minus four frames of the actual label. And so kind of unpacking that piece by piece, um, F1 score, people are probably somewhat familiar with. You just want to get a lot of true positives and not many false positives or false negatives. That's kind of the gist of it. Um, but then IOU is measuring the amount of overlap and union that you have. And so you're trying to make it so your bounding box closely matches with the bounding box of the label without having too much excess. And so an IOU of 0.35 basically just means that you have a decent amount of overlap. 0.35 is actually a fairly low threshold. You can have quite a bit of extra overlap where you can under predict by a little bit and you'll still be fine. Um, and then they also have that extra wiggle room or plus, or plus or minus four frames. So you can say, I think that there's a collision that occurs in frame 45 at this specific bounding box. 
and if they labeled it in frame 47, you still get points for it because they realize that there's going to be some imprecision in terms of the labels and then what everyone defines as when the actual collision occurred because it is 60 frames per second. So um, one person could say, yeah, they impacted in this frame and another person could say, yeah, they impacted three frames later, but it looks virtually the same. So they can't expect your model to necessarily get that perfectly correct. Um, and so um, with that complex, complex metric, there's a lot of different ways that you can fail. You can predict a bounding box that doesn't overlap with any of the labels. That's an obvious one. So you say that there's a collision there. There's not actually a collision there. You get a false positive. Um, you can potentially make multiple predictions for a single label. So if you see that there's a, a collision at one spot and you have one bounding box that covers the left side and one bounding box that covers the right side, one of them will be marked as a true positive and another one will be marked as a false positive because you made multiple collision predictions for the same actual occurrence. Um, and then the other thing is you can just not make a prediction and actually there was a prediction somewhere and that counts as a false negative. Um, so you have to kind of defend against all of these different things and try to balance it in order to maximize your F1 score but this turned out to be fairly difficult because there's no way to get a neural network to directly optimize for all of these different conditions all at the same time. Um, and so in the end, there's only one way to get a successful prediction and that's getting a bounding box for a specific frame as within plus or minus four um, and has above an IOU of 0.35 and hasn't already been accounted for. So if you have multiple, so if you have a prediction on frame 45, 46, 47, 48, all around the same bounding box, one of them might show up as a true positive and the rest is false positive. So you have to defend against that in some way. Hey uh, Ryan. Yeah. Just out of curiosity, if um, if you have a helmet to helmet collision, was that counted as two collisions or as just one combined collision, do you know? Um, I'd have to look at that. It, it seemed to me typically that it would be one bounding box that kind of encompassed the area between them, um, but I'd have to look at that. Because I definitely, I, when I was inspecting predictions, I definitely saw two boxes around what looked like one collision, but I'm not sure exactly how they handled that necessarily. Thanks. Yeah. Um, so going along with the custom metrics still, because this is fairly important, it was pretty central to the competition, um, looking at what, what the label actually means. So you, you have your normal, a single image, your image is 1280 by 720, I have height and width mixed up, but oh well. Um, <laughs> you have a single picture, that's a certain height, a certain width, and it has a certain number of channels. So you say you've got your red, green, blue. And then if you have video, you have a whole bunch of these stacked together in a sequence. Um, so then you have your number of frames on top of that. So this is a whole bunch of red, green, blue stacked together. Um, and then what the label actually represents in this case, what you're looking for is kind of a hole that's been punched through nine consecutive frames and you want to um, find that bounding box. And so what most people did is they said, okay, our label is this hole that is punched nine deep and we want to predict on all of those frames, this bounding box. Um, but the, we, later on, I'll talk more about the metric and, and what people had to do in order to train on that and then transfer it and process it a bit further to, to clean it up. Um, so we started with the baseline and the way people configure this is sort of an object detection task. And so if you're familiar with object detection work or, or not, um, basically the gist of it is it's the kind of system that just draws a bounding box around a single image or a, a video. And it's trying to do something like this, where it's saying, okay, here's the bounding box that captures this person. Here's the bounding box that captures this kite. And then in a different scene, you might have a car and a stoplight and a something else. And so the object detection is just trying to draw bounding boxes around 
um, objects of interest potentially. And so there's a lot of interesting architectural stuff that goes on those sorts of systems, but it's kind of beyond the scope of this right now. I'm not necessarily prepared to present on that, but the system that most people use is this efficient debt architecture. Um, it's just a, a public implementation of um, this, this um, research paper that, that has shown to be successful at this task. And so regardless of the internal architecture, the interesting thing that it actually outputs is it does a regression and it outputs bounding box coordinates. So it has four different outputs on this aspect. So it says X, Y, width, and height. So it's saying basically there's going to be an object starting here and going this wide and this tall, and then that encapsulates a kite. So it's doing this classification. Typically what it would do is it would classify into a bunch of different tasks. So it would say kite, person, car, stoplight, a bunch of different stuff. But in our case, we're just looking for collisions. And so what, what people did is they just said, we only have one class, it's just collision or no collision. Um, and then on top of that, it also outputs a confidence. So it's saying from zero to 100%, how much do we think that this is um, the certain object? So it's outputting these six different things. And then we can kind of piece that together to be our predictions for the, um, the helmet collisions. And so, like I was mentioning before, what people did is they expanded the labels to be plus or minus four frames because they know that that's what we're kind of being graded on. And it's sort of a free augmentation. So if we just took the one label that we were given, um, then we have very, very limited number of samples to actually look at. So we see one specific scenario where two people collided um, and we only have a single frame of that, um, but it's acceptable for us to have said it was a collision for plus or minus four frames, then we might as well use those in order to, in order to have more examples of that collision occurrence. Um, and so the way people did that, we have the tracking of the helmet all throughout the play um, and even for the specific person. So they said, this person collided on frame 45 look where they were in frame 44, 43, 42, 41, and also going up later into the frames and see where they were and then mark all of those as collisions as well. Um, so my, my visualization from the previous box where I just took a straight punch through the, the, the volume of the video is not necessarily accurate because they also had it moving along with the helmet of, um, of the player that they knew collided. Um, so then one of the problems with this is if you're training on nine frames, the problem is you're making nine predictions for the same actual collision. And so you need some way to reduce that to a single prediction. Otherwise you're going to have a huge number of false positives. Even if you got a perfect model that captured every single one under this, uh, under this training setup, um, you would end up with one true positive and eight false positives and your score would be completely awful under this metric. And so you need some way to clean that up. And so what a lot of people did is various forms of post-processing. Um, so you can filter just based off of the confidence. So in the previous slide, I was talking about um, the model is outputting a confidence that it's a collision. And so you can just kind of cap it and you can say, um, we only count it as a collision if it outputs above 0.5 for example. And then that will hopefully filter things down so you only get predictions that are very confident and it might reduce some of those false positives. Um, and then the other thing people did is they found that the model was continuing to make overlapping predictions. So if you look in the bottom left here, you might have one prediction that's saying, here's where a collision occurred. And then another prediction saying, this is where a collision occurred. And they're only a few pixels off. And so with that threshold of um, 0.35 IOU, you're not really adding anything by predicting two here. You could just combine these and then you'll still probably have an IOU 0.35 and you'll still capture the same actual occurrence, but you'll, you'll get rid of a false positive by just combining them. 
And so that was one of the tricks that people figured out is it, if there's a high overlap, just combine them and then you don't have any problem with that. You can reduce your, your false positives by a massive margin just by combining them on a single frame. And then the other thing that um, we figured out was um, even across frames. So let's say that we have the same bounding boxes, but we split them across two different frames. So we have one prediction on frame 57 and one prediction on frame 58. And they're very similar. They're only shifted by a few pixels. Because of that wiggle room of plus or minus four frames, we can also just combine these. We can just say, yeah, we think there is actually a collision on frame 57, and we're going to get rid of the prediction on frame 58 because it's redundant. It doesn't really add any value. It's not going to catch any new cases. It's just going to give us a false positive and, and hurt our score in some way. Um, and so those are those are a few different ways that people applied post-processing. And then another one is they looked for consensus between the, the two different views. So if you have a collision in the um, endline view and the sideline view, then it's more likely that there was actually a collision because you can say, okay, it seems like there was a collision on frame 57 because we have agreement between our model on both different sides. And if there is an agreement, then you can just filter it out and you can say this seems like some sort of anomaly or false positive. Talking a little bit about our solution, um, we basically stuck with the baseline model. Um, people set up with efficient debt D5, which is just a certain size of backbone that we use. Um, and it turned out to be fairly compute intensive, but pretty much anything you do with um, object detection is going to be fairly difficult, especially when the resolution is as big as we had. 1280 by 720 is, is a lot of data. Um, and so we tried larger and smaller backbones, but ultimately it didn't really make much difference. It didn't, it didn't seem to change the score at all. Um, so we didn't really worry about that too much. We just stuck with the default implementation. Um, and so one of the things that we did is we had um, multiple models. So we, we trained the different sizes and we said, these all seem to do reasonably the same, but we can take multiple of those and we can combine them using this technique called weighted box fusion. And so, um, there, there's some, there's a common technique, NMS, non-max suppression, that is used for these tasks. That's basically saying our model is going to output a whole bunch of bounding boxes and we need some way to reduce them down to the actual like best bounding box that we can find. Um, and what non-max suppression does is it kind of looks and factors in the confidence and then it tries to um, get all of the bounding boxes properly aligned. So there's not a whole bunch of overlap and there's not redundant predictions of the same region. Um, but what weighted box fusion is a little bit different in that it's actually trying to combine the predictions and get all of the overlapping regions and find the sort of consensus. So non-max suppression is more focused on reducing um, the number of overlaps and weighted box fusion is trying to say, it looks like there's a lot of overlap in all these different regions and I'm going to make a new bounding box that covers the highest area of density basically. Um, and so the, the details of this are in this package and it's actually from someone who um, does Kaggle competitions, it, it, it's spawned from that. Um, and they have a bunch of different techniques on there that people can check out and utilize now. Um, the other avenue that we looked at, a bunch of different augmentation things. One of the things that originally kind of made me um, curious about on, on this competition was we have so few plays that I don't think we even cover every team in the NFL. So if we get really good at detecting um, helmets for the chargers, we might not be able to detect helmets for some other team that uses a totally different color scheme potentially. And so 
I thought potentially augmentation would be very important just to make it robust to all the different team colors and fields and, and all kinds of stuff like that. But in the end, we tried a whole bunch of different augmentation things, some of them pretty fancy, some of them fairly standard. And we ended up using a, a pretty typical augmentation scheme doing horizontal flips and vertical flips and adding some noise and, and doing some color shifts and stuff like that. But ultimately, I don't think it was really that important. I don't think it made a huge impact. We didn't necessarily do um, a complex study of it, but on top of that, we had really noisy results on the leaderboard. So it was hard to de definitively say if any augmentation was truly making a massive impact. Um, so two of the things that we had, we had the labels of the collisions, then we also had the labels of the helmets. And so one way you could set it up is you just do detection of the collisions and that's all you care about. But then another setup you can do um, that might help your model be additionally supervised in some way is you also do object detection of the helmets. And so you have one class as helmets, another class is collisions, and you're trying to learn both of them at the same time. And potentially learning the helmets might be useful for learning the collisions. Um, but we tried that and it ended up not really making any, any impact necessarily. Um, so in the baseline kernel um, that, that people posted on Kaggle, one of the issues that I found with it was that it um, had a, a sort of leakage in the training and validation. So some of the data that they were training on might be a different view of a video that was in the validation set. So let's say we have play number 179 that's in the training set and we have the end line view of it. And then on the validation set, we might have the sideline view of the same play 179. And so it's not necessarily the same thing, but we do somewhat have a, a prior that we, we learned from this video clip before, basically just from a different video angle. And so um, one of the first things I did was I rearranged it. So the, the plays only end up in one side of the train of their validation. And that seemed to make it so the, the numbers lined up a bit better. Um, and then the, the primary contribution I would say that we had was we made some kind of complicated post-processing code. So we had that issue of we're making nine predictions for every true label, and then we have to figure out some way to reduce that down to um, reduce our number of false positives. So we take that prediction and then we crush it down in some way. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about the post-processing um, right now. And so the, the gist of it is you start with a big pile of bounding boxes for a whole video. So you have 400 frames of video, let's say, and you've done bounding boxes for all of them. And then um, you take that and then you're trying to find um, any other boxes in that pile within plus or minus four frames that have a high degree of overlap. So you have this whole pile of boxes you look at the first box, you say, which boxes occur on plus or minus from this frame? How many of them have heavy overlap? So beyond like 0.7 IOU. If they have beyond that threshold, then we just form those all into a clump basically. And then we check if any of the boxes in that clump have beyond a certain confidence. Um, and then after that, we do this sort of condensing step. So we have this clump that says all of these bounding boxes are the same. They're all within a certain number of frames. They all overlap a certain amount. Um, and then we just kind of crush them down into a single prediction for a single frame. So if you have predictions on frames five, six, seven, eight, there's a whole bunch of overlap on them. You, you take the largest box that, that encompasses all of them and then you say, okay, we had predictions five, six, seven, eight. Let's just pay, let's just place a single prediction that encompasses all of them on frame six or seven, somewhere in the middle. Um, and so that's that's roughly the post-processing code that we had there. And then the other thing that was mixed in there was if there's a bounding box 
um, somewhere and it has no overlaps with any other bounding box, even across that four frame window, then we just drop it because we say, well, it doesn't seem like any of the other outputs agree with that. So even if it's high confidence, let's just remove it. Um, and so that was kind of the gist of what we did. I won't spend too much more time on it because it, it, it performed decently, but once you see what other people did, you'll say, okay, yeah, that was garbage. You don't need to worry about that anymore. Um, so this ended up getting a score of 0.2599 on the private leaderboard, ended up putting us at 45th. Um, we tried a whole bunch of stuff. Lots of it didn't work. We didn't have that much time though. Typically um, the, the things that didn't work slide would be a series of slides. It would be like five slides, but since this competition was so short, I'll just run through it quickly on one slide. Um, so like I mentioned, we did different model backbones so we can try larger models, smaller models. Ultimately, it didn't seem to make a difference. Um, we tried different augmentations. Ultimately, didn't seem to make a huge difference. We tried 3D weighted box fusion. Um, so in that weighted box fusion example I showed earlier, it's just 2D. You're just looking on a single frame. There's a whole bunch of bounding boxes. You can also configure it so it's looking across three dimensions. So you also have that time dimension. You can say, give every box a certain amount of depth and then look how they overlap and then do some fusion between all of them. Um, I tried that in various different ways and it didn't really seem to work. And some other people um, mentioned trying it and for whatever reason, it just didn't seem to perform very well. Um, we looked at alternate loss functions, but ultimately I think you would have had to do something really crazy to try to actually directly optimize for the goal that we were working for. So you might've gotten something that did something interesting, but wouldn't necessarily optimize directly for the competition metric. So even if you got good results, you might've been doing something sort of tangential to the actual goal. Um, one of the other things that we were looking at was just a sort of frame level classifier. So you just look at every frame individually and you just do a classification. Do you think there's a collision or not anywhere? It doesn't matter if there, there's a given location, you just have to say, um, is there a collision here or not? Um, and ultimately we, we looked at our model and we found it's pretty accurate at determining that there's no collisions because you can just see there's certain frames where it's like they haven't started moving or everyone is very spread out because they've, they've made a pass and now everyone's just kind of separated. Um, so um, the frame classifier didn't really seem to do a whole lot because the object detection system was already kind of capturing that. Um, one of the other things we were interested in was giving the model the frame number because we, we looked at the statistics of it and because of the way the data was lined up, um, I, don't, I don't remember the exact timing, but basically the, um, it was something like um, the video starts 10 frames before the snap. So you're basically guaranteed that 10 frames before the snap, there's not going to be any collisions. No one's even moving. Um, and then a few frames after that, people start moving, so there's not going to be a collision there either. And then a little bit after that, then everyone collides. All of the, all of the linesmen smack straight into each other. Everyone starts moving. Um, and so then there's a whole bunch of collisions in that certain region. And then after that, once people have started running and moving, they've separated a little bit. And then the, the, the probability of a helmet collision just keeps going down and down over time. Um, and so we thought maybe giving the model that that the, the frame number would tell it something about, well, um, this is frame zero, so just don't even output a bounding box because it's, it's not likely that there's going to be a collision there. Um, and so we looked at various different ways of doing that, but ultimately didn't find something that was super satisfying. It's not that easy to combine um, the frame information early enough into the pipeline to really make a difference. Um, the other two things that I looked at a little bit was um, optical flow and frame differencing. So in collision, um, it's very important to see some sort of motion. So the people were separated, now they're touching. That means that there was a collision. So you need to find some way of um, showing that motion and optical flow 
is this technique of um, basically looking at, at frames and, and reasoning about the motion. And so that's what this bottom right corner is showing is the optical flow between two consecutive frames. You can see that there's um, small amounts of movement everywhere. And then the field is completely static. So you don't, you don't see anything going on. Optical flow um, is good for motion estimation and a bunch of other stuff. But it's also kind of interesting in the aspect of it removes the whole color aspect of the helmets and, and the field and all of that stuff. It just completely removes the background because the background is not moving. So it just turns it all black, basically. Um, and then the other angle is just frame differencing. So you just take the two consecutive frames. You just say, do this one minus that one. And then you can say what changed between these two. And that also captures some aspect of motion. Um, and so I was a bit hopeful about those, but I think that the, the downfall from that was that the, the time granularity is, is too small. So if you have the difference between 60 frames per second, the difference between two consecutive frames is not very much. Not, things, things just have hardly even moved. Um, that's just like a twitch. Um, and then I also added some stuff that I think would have worked if we had spent more time on it, but we didn't necessarily have enough time to fully complete it, um, was doing a confidence threshold that varied with the, the, the index of the frames. So like I was saying, we saw that property where there's no collisions from zero to 25 roughly. And then after that, there's a whole bunch of collisions. And then after that, it, it goes down over time. Um, so the way we configured things, it was just a flat threshold of 0.3 or something like that. I don't remember our exact number, but we could have done something sort of um, piecewise that might have been even better. Um, and then another thing was we could have done a max number of detection per frame or per video. Um, so one of the issues that we saw is you can have a single frame where your model just goes haywire and it outputs 75 predictions. And that can tank your entire score because you have um, you only have a, a very small number of collisions actually in the set. And if you get 75 false positives on a single frame, that can cause you a lot of problems. That can cut your score in half, basically. Um, and so it probably would have been good to put some sort of safeguard on that and say, don't allow beyond a certain number of predictions on a single frame, or don't allow above a certain number of predictions on a video, because we know that there's only a maximum of, let's say, 30 collisions in a video, even in the worst possible one. Um, so you shouldn't ever allow your model to output much more than that. Um, so moving on to our work, um, looking at the first place solution, I don't know if anyone had any, any questions before I move on to this. All right, um, so looking at the first place solution, um, there is a definite pattern. So we were, we were looking across all of the write-ups that people created and there was clearly a magic trick that we missed. And so the magic trick is that people did 2D detection of the helmets. So same as we were doing, except for our detection was focused on the collisions. They just said, we're going to detect all of the helmets, basically. One small implementation detail, they used a different system. They used what's called YOLO V5. You only live once um, instead of the efficient debt package that we used. But it, they, they seem to perform, YOLO seemed to perform a little bit better, but not like by a huge margin. And so they detect these helmets instead of the collisions. And then what they do is they um, take um, some frames from before, some frames from after, and then they do some sort of 3D classification of this. So they have the history information of the movement, and then they have it um, very specifically for that certain region of the video. Um, so that was kind of the general pattern that we saw in all of the top solutions. For this one specifically, he did some interesting stuff where he estimated the average motion of the helmet using optical flow. 
So he's looking at how much a certain player moved um, across several frames. And then he's saying, okay, I'm going to take this bounding box and I'm going to just continue sliding it across the video at a constant velocity um, that I know that they're moving at. And then he took 16 frames. Um, so I, I guess eight, eight before and eight after. Um, and then he, he used that motion in order to keep the box centered on their helmet across the play. And so keeping it at a constant motion, in theory, it should keep the helmet somewhat centered, but it also captures the acceleration or deceleration because it's moving the crop at constant velocity, but the person probably isn't moving at constant velocity. If they're moving at a certain speed and then they suddenly stop, that probably means that there was a collision. Um, or they just tried to stop, but you at least have some information about how they were moving and then how their motion may have changed based simply on where they are within the image. So you can see in the bottom right corner, the, the crop is centered on this helmet. And if he continues moving this direction, then the crop is going to continue moving this direction. Um, and so you can learn something about that. And since you have 16 frames of data, you can also reason about um, they were moving fast and now they're moving slow and now they collided. And so you can see that whole history. And then they just do a, a classification on the whole thing saying, is this a collision or not? And so they do these clips around all of the bounding boxes and then they train the secondary system to do that classification. Um, but even in this case, you're going to have a whole bunch of extra false positives because you're doing that cropping process for every single frame for every single helmet. And so it, it runs into the same problem. And the way that he filtered for this was looking for the ones with the highest confidence. So same as before, you just set a high confidence, it's going to remove a whole bunch of false positives. Um, and then he also did this extra process of suppressing predictions of the same player within 16 frames. He doesn't really specify exactly how he determined that, but he used some method in order to say, okay, don't make the same prediction for the same player for 16 consecutive frames. That's just not what we want. Um, and then another um, complexity that was added here that seemed to be helpful is people started making predictions based on the impact type rather than just the impact. And what people found out is we're very, very good at finding helmet to helmet impacts, but we're not very good at finding helmet to shoulder or helmet to ground or anything else like that. Because it's very easy to see, okay, here's a helmet, here's a helmet, they're close by, they're impacting. But it's fairly difficult to find, okay, this helmet is close to this person's body, or this helmet is on the ground. You just can't really tell. Um, so they, they found that that was one of the major downfalls. And one of the ways they fixed that, they tried to help the model learn a little bit better, is they gave the labels with that additional granularity saying, this is helmet, this is helmet ground. And so in theory, it could learn a little bit better about exactly what it was looking for with those various different conditions. Um, and this eventually scored um, 0.7527 on the private leaderboard. And so just, just for reference, that's like three times better than what our model did. You, you very rarely see that in the competition. Very often you look at a competition leaderboard and you go, okay, everyone's within like less than a tenth of a percent or something insane like that. This, this was a competition that was so short and had such varied solutions and was such a difficult problem that there was huge um, separation between the different um, scores. This is even a large leap between the, the first team and the second team. Um, so the second team followed similar procedure, not quite as complicated, um, but they did the same thing. First stage detector using YOLO V5. So they have this object detection that locates the helmets and then they have to do this process of assigning labels back to the helmets so they take, um, this is the procedure that they're showing in this image over here. 
So if they have output from their helmet detection system and they say, okay, there's a, this blue box, that's a helmet, this orange box, it's incorrect, but it thinks that's a helmet. And then we'll mark it as a collision if there's actually a ground truth that is here and has above a certain amount of overlap with the blue box. But the orange box doesn't have enough overlap, so that doesn't count as a collision. So this blue box marked as a collision, this orange box not marked as a collision, even if this green box was originally the collision box. Um, and so um, what they do with that helmet detector is they output a whole ton of helmets um, and then they make a whole bunch of crops of those. So they, they, um, they do the same process of kind of going, let's do plus four frames, minus four frames. And then on top of that, let's zoom out a little bit so we can get some additional context around that um, image. Um, and then they do the same thing of a 3D convolutional neural network that looks at those, um, those helmet crops, those 3D helmet crops. And then they also did the prediction by type. Um, and then they applied some post-processing on it. So they're filtering by confidence. Um, they did what we were looking at doing, which is they said anything before 25 frames, just shut it off. There's no, there's no collisions there. Um, and then they did video wide non-max suppression, which I thought was kind of interesting because I think that's a little bit aggressive. They basically said that they took the entire video, all of the bounding boxes that were output, then they just crushed it down to a single thing and they did non-max suppression. And they said, um, if there's any of these overlapping, basically, we're not going to allow it through. So if you found a bounding box that was in this region, you can never find another, um, another collision for that bounding box, even if it happens 100 frames later. Um, so I, it, it worked well because they got second, but I'm, I'm kind of surprised that that would be the case, that there wouldn't ever be a case where there's another collision within a single video. That, that greatly simplifies things though, if you're just saying I could just crush the whole thing and then just look at the overlaps and say, here's where the only bounding boxes actually were. Um, and then the other thing they did is they did the top K, which is kind of what I was talking about. They just said, um, even for these predictions, we're only going to do maximum of 20 predictions for a single video. And they just looked at the confidence and they said, let's just pick the top 20 um, if it met all of the other thresholds. Um, and then they also listed some of the things that didn't work for them. So adding the frame information and also some of the other additional info. Um, so I, I mentioned earlier about that tabular data that shows sort of the like global positions uh, of the people. Um, and included in that was also the acceleration, deceleration, speed, and stuff like that. And the interesting thing, the kind of historical Kaggle fact, is the second place team had a solution in a previous NFL competition that used that same tracking data to really good effect and just completely blew everyone else out of the water using that tracking information data. Um, so I was, I was hopeful that we, we would see that again, that they did something interesting and clever to combine the tracking information along with the video, but they said they tried a whole bunch of stuff and it ultimately just couldn't be useful in any way. Um, and then another thing that they tried that I thought was interesting that didn't work is they tried a Siamese view model. So looking simultaneously at the end line view and the sideline view, pass both of those into a communal model that then tries to extract the information from them and then make some prediction with them. And they said, for whatever reason, that just didn't give them any benefit. And then the third place solution, um, you'll, you'll start to see a pattern. Everyone kind of did this same procedure at, at the top of the leaderboard. Um, so these people used efficient debt um, the other two used YOLO, but this is the same one that we used for the competition. And they used it just as a system to generate candidate bounding boxes. So this is kind of the same as the past two. Um, 
And then after that, what they did is they took um, plus or minus four frames. They turned them into grayscale to make them slightly more lightweight. And then they stacked them up and then they passed them into a classifier like the other people did. Um, and so with this extra temporal, temporal information focused in on the zone where helmets are, they can do a classification and say, is there actually a collision or not? And so this was kind of useful because they actually reported the gain that they got from this extra binary model. Um, they said that they jumped all the way from 0.3 something to 0.6 just by adding this additionary, additional binary model. Um, the other people kind of mentioned their overall score, but they didn't actually say how much benefit was this simple binary model applied on top of this. Um, hey, Ryan, can I ask a question? Yeah. Um, up top, when you say they generated candidates, was it helmet candidates or collision candidates? Or so, so the same for, difference? It, it, it's basically the same thing. Um, so what they did in the second place and first place solution is they were purely looking for helmets. So they just said, try and gather up all of the helmet bounding boxes. What these guys did based on what I read from them is they actually train the model to look for collisions, but then they just set the um, threshold absurdly low. So they set it to like 0.1 or something like that. So it just let all possible collisions through. Um, okay. So th this one is a little bit different. They were actually doing candidate collisions rather than helmets. Um, but I think ultimately it probably ended up being functionally the same thing. Um, so kind of, so actually a little similar to when we read the PyTorch book, they did segmentation classification for tumors, right? Mm -hmm. So they set the threshold very low for the segmentation because they wanted, they didn't want to have any false negatives. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So then they still passed in zillions of candidates to the classifier. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And and I think here they're using fixed crops and, and the x-ray example the simplified example in the book was not a fixed size, but nevertheless, um, they're sending crops to the classifier. Yeah, yeah, definitely a similar similar concept. I I hadn't even thought of that. That would have been useful when I was working on the competition. Um, but yeah, con continuing on their solution, so they they kind of went down the path of. Um, let's combine the predictions from these two different views. And the heuristic that they used was, we have these predictions from these two different views. If there's agreement between the two different views on a collision on a certain frame, then we only have to have a confidence of 0.25 on both. But if there's only a collision detected on one frame and not the other, then the threshold has to be 0.5 or 0.45. Um, so if there is an agreement from the other one, then the confidence has to be higher for us to actually let the prediction through. Um, and then they did um, another thing that was kind of similar to the other people in that looking across frames, if a bounding box had um, any amount of overlap, so they said beyond 0.25, we're going to deem them similar and we're just going to drop them because they're um, they're redundant. It doesn't really give us any additional benefit to predict them. Um, so this is sort of their pipeline. They start from the raw video. They pass it through efficient debt. Efficient debt finds a whole bunch of potential collisions. And then they, they take crops of it. Um, so they extend it to be three times the height, three times the width. So you have a, a wide region around it. And then they say, let's look four frames behind, four frames ahead. And then the new classifier model looks at the grayscale version of that. That's kind of um, punched through time. And so that's still a, a 3D CNN classifier? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. <coughs> um, and so other interesting things, I read through most people's solutions and I just thought I would kind of share the rest of the stuff that people were doing. Um, 
a lot of the people at the top did very custom stuff, but there are actually ways to solve some of these problems just using somewhat off the shelf stuff. And so one of the things that was new to me that I thought was kind of interesting is this concept of an IOU tracker. There's this package called IOU tracker and I figured that someone had solved this problem, but I, I didn't know exactly how. And in object detection, just generally, if you're looking at video, you have the same object that's moving across the screen. So if you're just tracking someone walking, you have a bounding box for every single frame, but you can generally tell that's the same object that was throughout the whole thing. And so um, there's this library called IOU Tracker that basically just says, yeah, we can take your predictions across all of these different frames and we can kind of piece them together and we can say, yeah, this is roughly the same object that's just been kind of meandering through the frame. Here's a different object. Um, we think this is all the same object kind of going throughout time. Um, and then even with this library, you can do some of those reduction techniques like we were doing saying, okay, there, there is one person in this frame. It's not a new person every single frame necessarily. And so that, that library can help you do that sort of condensing into a single prediction. And so several people in the top 50 or so use that IOU tracker library in order to do that step. Um, um, one of the other things that showed up a few times in the top 10 solutions was um, some form of marking the center of the helmet and the other helmets. And so combining this information together, you can say, um, so taking the crops, like we were seeing from the previous solutions, you can also mark, okay, our model found um, a, our, our person of interest, their helmet is right here. And then our model detecting all of the helmets can say, okay, and then we're also looking at a helmet right here, helmet right here, helmet right here. And so you have the raw video and then you have the helmet we're interested in and inspecting right now. And then you also have the helmets of the surrounding players. And because that's one of the biggest concerns is helmet to helmet contact, um, you can say, oh, this one's pretty close to this one, close to that one, close to that one might have collisions with any of these. And just looking at their movement throughout the frames, the model can reason a bit better about the actual um, the possibility of a collision. Um, and it's fairly free to do this because our model was already finding the helmets, and this is just helping that 3D classification step. Um, and people tried various different um, flavors of that, but I thought it was kind of interesting that just plotting a channel with a dot on it actually turned out to be fairly useful, it seemed. Um, and then a, another library that a lot of people started using, I've seen it a few different times, but it seemed to be pretty prevalent in this competition, was called Slow Fast. And so this is a library from Facebook um, that does various different video classification things. And it has pre-trained models on different tasks. So if you're actually doing something with video, you can use um, their models and you can get good performance out of the box um, because there's a lot of um, models that are available for individual images, but not necessarily prepared for video tasks. Um, and then one of the things I saw from a few different people was something that I've kind of mentioned is a variable confidence threshold. So saying basically, um, from frames zero to 25, make it impossible to make a prediction or something like that. And then after that, say, okay, our threshold is going to be fairly low. We know that a lot of collisions happen around the 25 to 100 mark. And then after that, the probability keeps going down because now everyone's spread out. They're not necessarily um, scuffling as much. Um, and then another thing that people mentioned is dilating their box in some way. So when you make errors, you expect sometimes your box is going to be too small, sometimes your box is going to be too big, but the way that things were configured um, with, a, with a, a IOU of 0.35 being all you needed, 
actually tending your boxes to be bigger was slightly beneficial because that meant that you were more likely to um, enclose the, the target box. You weren't going to come short potentially. And so you make bigger boxes and you make less of them and then you have less false positives and you're more likely to actually um, capture that prediction that you're interested in. Um, that was something that my team had talked about fairly early on, um, kind of the logic of that being you can make a box two times as big but um, have less of them and then you end up having a better score in the end. Um, so that was something that I thought was kind of interesting. Um, yep, yeah. and so that's all I have for today. I don't know if you guys have any additional pending questions at this point. That was a really cool summary, Ryan. Thanks. Yeah, that was great, uh, Ryan. I was looking at the first solution uh, discussion on the on the discussion board, and they mentioned something about this module called temporal shift module. Mm -hmm. There's a paper behind it. I was trying to uh, take a look, but is that something that was unique to the first place, or you saw it used other other places? And do you have any idea how that works? It it was unique to the first place solution, but if you if you look in the discussion a little bit further down, the second place team also tried it out, and they said basically it doesn't look like it's any different from just doing a three D CNN or something else like that, which is why I. I omitted it because I, I think it's an interesting technique, but I don't think it was actually material to the, the additional performance. Um, my, my understanding of it though, it's the temporal shift module or something like that. My, my vague understanding of it is you basically um, just um, have, have shifted time fragments that you've kind of sliced together. So you might take one frame, um, two frames later, four frames later, et cetera. And then you just do a sort of some, some sort of module that is looking across all of them to combine the information. Um, but to, to me, it didn't look like it was actually material to his success. I think the the more valuable part was all of the additional stuff he had done in terms of keeping the bounding boxes around the helmets and centered and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So Ryan, drilling down a little bit into the first place solution, you said that he sort of looked at the average speed that this helmet was moving. So did he do some calculation across multiple frames to, to calculate that average speed? Yeah, yeah, he didn't really detail that too much. I was a little bit disappointed in, in that aspect because the second place team did a really good job about detailing all the different details. Um, the first place solution didn't mention that stuff. So he said that he did something to figure out the motion and he tried optical flow and he tried a different technique called raft. Um, but he didn't specifically say how he derived the average motion in terms of pixels or anything like that. Um, okay. But so essentially, if hypothetically the player was moving very fast and they were moving two pixels up and two pixels left per frame, right? And mm -hmm. that means that his crop plus one, plus two, plus three would, would be shifted mm -hmm. from, from uh, the XY coordinates of of the of the the main the starting point plot right yeah yeah that's my understanding of it okay so so in theory the 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 classifier could say okay i've got assuming they're moving at constant velocity right you know i've got helmet in the same spot and then in the next frame same spot in the next frame same spot in the next frame and then all of a sudden because you hit a wall and you stopped, then all of a sudden the helmet starts jerking off to the side because the camera's mm -hmm. 
the, the crop still moving, but the, the helmet all of a sudden stopped, right? Yeah. So it's sort of like you see helmet, helmet, and then all of a sudden, bam, something happened to it. Yeah. Yeah. That's, yeah, that's my understanding of it. I had another question regarding the second solution, Ryan. So you mentioned that they had done some previous work on detecting helmets or NFL related to that. They were working on a previously uh, considered like data set from NFL and you mm -hmm. said that they didn't help them. Can you uh, elaborate a little bit on that? So there, there was a previous NFL competition where the goal was to um, predict how many yards a, a rusher would take the ball. So basically we know the ball has been handed off to some running back. We want to know how many yards they're going to get up the field. And we have information about all of the, let me pull up this image again. So we, we, we basically have a, a frozen point in time. We say this player started here, this player started there, this player started there, et cetera. And we know at this specific time with this specific lineup, um, what is going to happen in this play basically? How, how far are they going to get down the field? And so taking all of that information, they were trying to say, accurately how how far do we expect the, the player to get down the field um, and they had this super interesting neural network architecture that used transformers and combined all of the different players and how they interacted and stuff like that um, and it's it's it was so accurate that it, it's it's what they use um, on the nfl on tv today it's actually if you see them do anything where they say like expected yards or something like that, um, they, they grade running backs and stuff like that based off of this metric because the model can say, um, we expect this player, they just got snapped the ball, we expect them to get three yards on this play. And then they can look at the running back and say, this person tends to exceed that expectation or this person um, doesn't meet that expectation. And they, they directly grade running backs based off of that um, criteria now, which is pretty interesting, but they, they had a, their, their model was completely blew everything else out of the water. It was, it was very interesting. And it, it, it was similar to this competition in that the performance was a large gap, but, um, they were the only person, the, they were the only team to have that gap. Everyone else was doing the thing where it's like, everyone gets 0.121 or 0.1205 or something like that. And they were like point one zero eight or something way lower than everyone else. So not exactly the same data set, not exactly the same task. Yeah, no, it, it, it wasn't using video or anything like that. It was just purely using a, a layout like this. So it's much simpler data actually, but it, it's tracking the players through time on this sort of game field board. Was there any solution that spent a lot of time in this alternative view that you mentioned is difficult to map? Um, I, I know that there was, there's this guy CPMP who spent some time figuring out a transform from one view into the other. Um, so he used this, I, I don't know the full details of it. I looked at it and I said, oh, that's interesting. But ultimately they, they applied it so late that they didn't get anything useful out of it, but they did some like homography transform where they basically said, okay, well, we can map all of these players to all of these players we see over here and then do a transform where we rotate and we do a perspective shift and then we get them to match together. And he wow. seemed to be pretty happy with, with how it worked out. But I think it was a little bit too complicated for, for me to fully grasp exactly what they were doing. Got it. It, it seems like for, for this competition, perhaps you could rule out collision candidates because you're like, hey, look, there's nobody near this guy. Shouldn't be predicting collision. I don't know how helpful that would be. Mm. But 
it seems to me you'd have a very difficult time telling a collision because like if you look at the linemen, right? They mash up against each other every single play. It's just a question of how their body's positioned, whether or not the head actually hits a shoulder or it, it stays slightly above it, right? So mm -hmm. it doesn't seem to me that from this sort of overhead XY coordinate view that you're really getting a lot of additional information. You're like, yeah, I know the two linemen are touching. It's just a question of whether or not the helmet touched. Yeah, yeah. So I have a, a sort of a step, take a step back question. So we're trying to predict this in order to be able to detect co he, uh, helmet collisions and, and potentially concussions, right? Would, if we take a step back, wouldn't the ideal solution perhaps be to have an accelerometer in the helmets and then? So that was, that was something that was actually in the discussion board very early on where people were saying, why don't we just have an accelerometer in the helmet? Why don't we? have a better signal than this. And what, what the NFL people laid out was basically, we have years and years of video. We don't have years and years of accelerometer data. And so what they want to do in, in the ideal world is create a good video system that can then look back at the full history of players and all of the games and stuff, and then be able to say, oh, it looks like this person just got beat to crap and they've had a whole ton of head collisions and then they can kind of look at that in the future and say, how are these people actually doing? Because we can't retroactively put accelerometers in players that already, already have retired, but we can do video analysis and we can look at the number of collisions they've had and, and stuff like that. So that was, that was the application that they laid out basically. Okay, that makes sense, cool. Yeah. I think there's some validity of the argument, although I don't necessarily completely buy it. Yeah, yeah. And and and, and I, I should say perhaps my, you know, my inherent trust level of the NFL is pretty low. <laughs> um, one of one of the guys who went to my college, he he won a bunch of um, pitch competitions. I was in the entrepreneurship section, so I. I met a bunch of people who were trying to start businesses. And one of the guys who was really successful, he was trying to start this business called FitGuard. And basically what it was, was a, um, a, a mouthpiece that protected their teeth. They all already wear them. But on top of that, it also um, um, had an accelerometer in them and it could raise a warning if it thought someone had a concussion or something like that. He was a rugby player and he had had several concussions already. And he thought that, well, this is an easy problem. We can just put an accelerator in a mouth guard, accelerometer in a mouth guard, um, and then have that hooked up to Bluetooth or whatever, and then give, give the coach a signal whenever someone takes a heavy hit. And we think that they probably had have some form of concussion. Um, and so he's been working on that for, I don't know how many years, but it doesn't seem like it's made any progress. And I don't think that you're going to convince people to wear a $150 mouth guard versus a 99 cent mouth guard anytime soon. So it, it's an interesting area of, of study, but I think it's gonna be a difficult ask. Some people won't even, I, I know some NFL players have had um, gotten in trouble because they don't even want to wear new standards of helmets. They put out new helmets that are supposed to be safer and people have refused to wear them basically because they just like the old ones. I, I will say getting a little bit political here that, you know, I, I think the NFL can easily afford the $150 mouth guards. Yeah. I don't know if they really want to know how many violent collisions there are because they would rather live in denial. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Yeah, I would agree with you. I so agree. I think that's that's the problem is if somehow having the accelerometers helped them keep people on the field, I think they would have had them like years ago, right? Yeah. But the problem is that the accelerometers, if anything, are taking people off the field. Mm -hmm. So Ryan, um, can I go back to the, the 
and you gave me earlier. So why does the NFL want to be able to go back and look at past video? And the reason I'm asking this question, because in my mind, I thought it was pretty settled, you know, hitting your head is bad. I mean, you know, we don't do this in boxing, for example. No one says, you know, I, I got to go back and analyze how many times this guy was, you know, punched in the head kind of yeah. thing, right? We just know it's bad. Don't, you know, try and avoid it if you possibly can. So what was the reasoning behind wanting to go back historically? I, they, they didn't really explain that a whole lot, but my, my, my best guess is that they just want to be able to look at it and kind of match with the data of how people actually turned out because if you can say okay this person ended up really messed up but that's because they got hit 600 times and then this other person only got hit 100 times and they're actually okay so may maybe 100 head collisions is okay you just have to make sure you don't cross the 500 mark or something like that but um that's just my my best guess is some way to map the the long-term data and also the number of collisions. Okay. Yeah, I think the long-term part is valid, right? If you could say this person's now 50 years old, let's you know see how many collisions they had and how are they now? This person's 60 years old, how many collisions did they have? How are they now, right? I think in general, that concept is okay. But yeah, I kind of, on the, on the uh, skeptical side, feel like we can make a bunch of noise doing this research as opposed to mm -hmm. um, truly trying to solve the problem. Well, thanks, Ryan. This was, this was really nice can overview. I, I, can I ask one last question? Yeah, go for it. You mentioned something about data augmentation. Is that like classical image data augmentation or is that specific to this video? Uh, feed that you had as input it was it was standard image augmentation so it's it's horizontal flips vertical flips some blurring some color shifting some some random different transforms all of this stuff from augmentations if I, I think i've mentioned that package here before um it wasn't anything specific to the video necessarily and that didn't give you a significant boost, right? Not necessarily. It's it's kind of hard to quantify, but I, I I don't no one did well in the competition because of augmentation. They did well in the competition because of that two-phase approach. And maybe augmentation pushed them maybe three to five percent in the right direction, but I don't think that that was really material in this case. But I also find interesting that your validation set, you only use a very small subset of it, right? You didn't use the entire validation set. Well, we 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 tried to do the whole cross-validation setup, but even in that case, we only have 120 videos total. And then the the test set that like actually held out data from the competition um, hardly had any. So that was that was just kind of difficult to gauge against. Mm -hmm. um, it was enough to be representative, at least. Like clearly, the best solutions were the best solutions. Hey Ryan, how much time did you sink into this? And either you know hours per week or total time? Just a rough estimate. Just curious. Um, I would say probably four hours a day for roughly two weeks. It's it's it's. Part of the difficult thing is some of the time is coding and some of the time is just waiting for a model to train. So it, it varies wildly from day to day. I might spend one day coding up a whole bunch of stuff and then the next three days, I'm just waiting for it to finish training. Okay, got it, thank yeah. you. All right, well, um, so, so Ryan, we've kind of set ourselves up for a bit of a long day. So yep. I think if we can call it here, then we can have a little